Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, today I'm coming from you, coming to you uh, from an extra bedroom in my house. I apologize for the uh, aesthetic behind me. Um, but we had some uh, uh, scheduling issues in the Bernstein household here in uh, Metro Detroit. But I'm very excited about this episode, like I am every episode. Uh, we're going to do a Life and Crimes, another life, another in our Life and Crimes series. And today we're going to discuss the life and crimes of Genovese Mob Capo, Springfield, Massachusetts, Don, Slain Don, Adolfo, Big Al, Bruno. And I am very, very uh, happy and eager to bring on um, the preeminent expert on mob activity in Springfield, Massachusetts, and all of Western Massachusetts, uh, Stephanie Berry of uh, MassLive.com. Stephanie, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Scott. Good to see you. I would just uh, not to pour it on too thick, but I would oh, say that, away, I would away. say that Stephanie isn't just one of the best mob reporters in America, uh, which she is, um, regardless of of gender or region. But without question, in my mind, and all due respect to all the great female crime reporters out there, there's no better mob reporter. Uh, when it comes to uh, women in this game, and it's a tough game to be in, believe me, I'm sure, uh, it, it's Stephanie Berry. So th this is a, she can teach a master class on uh, reporting on the mafia. Again, no matter what age, race, gender, region, thank you, Stephanie, for joining us. Thank you. When it comes to Big Al Bruno, I mean, you've kind of, a uh, big part of your career has been, been reporting on the, all the machinations that led to, Big Al Bruno's assassination 20 years ago uh, this week. Um, he was murdered outside of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Social Club in the south end of Springfield on November 23rd, 2003. Um, I think it was the eve of his 58th birthday. Yes, he was turning 58 the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was a Sunday night. And, Sunday uh, night, yes. Thanksgiving was that Thursday. Right. It was probably, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, as you've already noted for your viewers, but that night that I got a very quick phone call and hang up to tell me that Bruno had been murdered in the parking lot, and then the person on the other end hung up the phone, was probably a defining moment in my career. And I don't even think I realized at the time how important that would be to just the trajectory of my career, never mind the trajectory of organized crime in Western Massachusetts and yep. greater Smithfield. I mean, I, tell me if I'm accurate in saying this. Uh, I wrote about it this week on my Gangster Report website. Uh, the murder of Al Bruno was, for all intents and purposes, the murder of the Springfield mob as it had been for, uh, you know, 80 years um, it, it, and not to say that the mob isn't around and doesn't exist anymore in Western Mass, but uh, the shadow of its former self, though I think yeah, everyone would agree. And Al was the last of kind of the the old school regime there from the uh, Scabelli brothers and Big No Sam, and you know dated back to those guys. It was really well connected around the country, not just in Massachusetts. He was a, a you know the consummate gangland politician. Um, I want to like turn it over to you to kind of let's start just talking about what, what his legacy is and then we can get into the murder and then get into the, the rise and then fall that led to the murder. Uh, I've, I've done some reporting in the last year about the months leading up to uh, Al's uh, demise and how the the winds were were blowing in that direction for about a year. Uh, right. But where, what do you say with um, when it, when it comes, when it comes to uh, Al Bruno's legacy and how people remember him, you know, the one thing that I want to get your comment on a multitude of things, but I've talked to some people in the last year or two, and they said Al was incredibly popular 
in his political self, uh, glad handing both white collar and blue collar, both in Springfield and out of Springfield. And he was beloved in that caricature. But where he wasn't beloved was more with, within the organization and the rank and file uh, felt constrained, um, uh, taken advantage of, I guess. It wasn't wasn't as beloved within the family as he was without, with outside the family. I would say that's by and large accurate. Um, yes, he definitely was a character quasi celebrity um, among so-called regular people. Um, I think the mob guys call him civilians, uh, politicians. He'd go out in public and he was definitely treated like a celebrity wherever he went. He soaked it up. He ate it up. You know, he responded, you know, really jovially to, to being adored. But people inside his circle, and I must admit, it took a lot of years for anyone to talk about Bruno's less, lesser qualities, more negative qualities, um, until a ways after he was gone, Wait, you know, long after he was murdered, that I've heard, and obviously I have no personal knowledge of this, but he ruled with a, he was, he was a happy fellow out in public, but he ruled with an iron fist. I've heard that he was greedy, you know, all the rackets that were intertwined between the various players. Um, you know, he was always after the money grab, perhaps wasn't as gen you know, generous as maybe he could have been. Um, and so I think this kind of wellspring of resentment started to build up um, in the year or two before his death. And would you say it's accurate to uh, portray the narrative in, let's say, the end of the Chabelli brothers uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s? Uh, and it are, well, I think within within Al's mind, it had it always it had always been a just like a known fate for him that he was going to end up in the skipper's chair uh, after um, Frankie Skyball and uh, Baba uh, were in, you know, Frank, well, Frankie yeah, Skyball died. died. Yep. And then, Baba. Kind of shelled, and then Baba was kind of shelved. Uh, shelved and he was also struggling with dementia. I think yeah. when he was shelved, when he pleaded guilty to this indictment, and he was indicted along with, I don't know, almost a dozen, dozen other gangsters and associates. I didn't even know at the time. The FBI, when I was in the courtroom, made a big deal about the fact that um, Baba um, admitted his affiliation with right. the Genovese. And that upset the Genovese in New York. It did. And and I actually, allocution, allocution. That's what, it, that's what it's called when you go into court and you, as part of your plea, Right. You allocate. It's just a, it's a legal term. Yes. So, um, and because I was still so new at the time, I didn't even really understand the significance of it. You know, I, I still I, I still don't honestly. <laughs> to be honest, with you, I, I don't. No. I don't. I, so a couple of the feds came up to me and said, "Oh my God, wait till you hear, you know, Babish Chevelles." And so I'm waiting for some bombshell, and then the allocution ends, and I say. Where was the bombshell? Well, he admitted his affiliation with the Genovese crime family. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it was significant in an inside baseball and a law, from a law enforcement standpoint. Um, but I think there were there was a little bit of jockeying going on. I don't think it was necessarily um, a foregone conclusion. Um, that did Al, th did Al think it was a foregone conclusion? You know, I... Probably, you know, I didn't have discussions with him about that, but I, he seemed to settle into the role. I mean, I felt like he played that role even when he wasn't the boss per se. Right. You know, he was always very colorful and jovial and a man out and, out and about, like a, like a guy half his age, you know, always out in bars and restaurants, you know, glad handing and rubbing elbows with people. So it was almost hard to put like a, a date on, you know, the day that he became the boss, because I feel like he acted like he was to some extent. Yeah. Well, he was you kind know? of a street, wouldn't you say he was kind of a street boss 
or yeah. Frankie Skyball and those guys. So it was like he the way that Frankie Skyball had been a street boss for for Big No Sam. Right. And so he was known as being a tough guy um, among tough guys. Um, he didn't seem to shy away from kind of any form of violence, as you noted in your blog. And I've noticed I've noted in my stories, nothing seemed to really stick to him for a long time. Um, and I think that's because at the time you can surround yourself with more people and more associates and, you know, that attempted murder of the, in the barn in Iguam, you know, so there was a mistrial. And yeah, let's, let's, let's give some people, uh, Stephanie, just for people that might not know all the backstory on that. Uh, in the nineties, he was indicted for an attempted murder that happened, I believe in 1981, mm -hmm. uh, where, a guy that was an affiliate of uh, a, a Northeast Pennsylvania uh, mob faction was believed to have been cooperating. Yeah. And they, they drew him up uh, to act to, to the Springfield area under the pretense of a, a score mm -hmm. and it lured him into a barn and yes. big Al came up behind him with a gun allegedly mm -hmm. um, and he shot him, but he didn't kill him. Right, right. And it took him a dozen years to make a case to bring. Right, and there were and they, two trials. And there were two trials, and they were very mm -hmm. high profile. Um, this they moved the venue, actually, to Hartford, Connecticut, I think, because there had been so much publicity surrounding it. This was before my time, right. but, you know, obviously I've read up on it quite a bit since. Right, but it was, uh, it, if he wasn't known... Before that trial, uh, outside of people that paid attention to the mafia, he definitely, he was capturing headlines in, in 92, 93, 94, uh, you know, quite a bit in the area over this, uh, this kind of soap opera mob murder that went wrong. And Right. And, you know, in the 80s, he was pretty active in terms of the classic rackets, like these junkets to... Um, Vegas and then, you know, the old fashioned numbers games that they, you know, the street numbers, brackets, loan sharking, obviously there was some violence happening, but it's still paled in comparison to 2003. Right. Um, and I think maybe law enforcement at the time, they may have been more tolerant of mob activity than they were you know, 10 or 20 years later. And it was a real soap opera um, that 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 was occurring surrounding the Big Al's rise and fall. And when I say rise, I mean, he had been rising for, for 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. became, my records and research, uh, like you said, it, there's kind of a, a difficult to delineate uh, when he was actually boss and when he was acting as a boss, mm -hmm. but I think he, he had his um, inauguration party, if you will. Uh, I believe it was at Ciro's on, uh, in January of Oh two. So he was, right. he was only boss on a, at least officially for less than two years. Yes. So when I say rise and fall, I'm talking about from, you know, the beginning of Oh two, to the end of 03 um wasn't so smooth. He his his trajectory had been pretty smooth. And like you said, he had been able to uh slide out of some some pretty major um cases in addition to the the uh the, the thing up in Aguam in the early 80s. You had a 1979 murder of a guy named Antonio Facente uh that he was allegedly bragged about, never got charged, but I uh, had been known to talk about his his role in it, um, but it it his his uh, his reign in the mafia or his uh, position in the mafia had always been pretty stable, and I know that because of that, uh, Frankie Skyball felt comfortable. I think starting in the '80s, sending him around the country mm -hmm. as like a representario. Uh, mm -hmm. I know he he was he was dealing with the Philly guys. I know. Philly, uh, Connecticut, uh, New ha uh, Hartford, New Haven, uh, I know Boston, down in Florida, yeah, yeah, in Boston, and uh, mm -hmm. so was it predictable? I, like I said, there was a little bit of a a um, a gap there 
because uh, Anthony DeLevo came in and, and was actually named boss for a short period of for time. For a minute, right. right. But then he and, went to prison. And then, um, and then Al takes over. And Actually, he, uh, DeLevo, so he pleaded guilty along with all those other guys. He was, ba he was a Baba guy. Yes. And he was very much the antithesis of the Bruno gangster. He was trying to keep everything low key. He had these, you know, um, warehousing and food businesses. He was not one to swagger around. He, he liked to stay under the radar. So he was boss for a minute. I couldn't put a time clock on it, that. I think it was like what, like 2001-ish through to two. I think it was like a year because right. I think Baba got uh brought down or got his stripes pulled uh, at some point in those two. Yeah, because they were all part of that same group yeah. of people who were indicted. But um I believe that the day DeLevo was set to ship off to prison after his guilty plea was the day of Al Bruno's funeral. Mm -hmm. Um not that that's like here and there, but you know it just shows you kind of all the interconnectedness and the tangled nature of that time. Um, and I would say, so you said less than two years. I want to say, I'm trying to dial back and do the math in my head. So he died. November in, of 03. No, November 2303. I want to say for a few months leading up to that anyway, was when Ar Artie Nigro had made Anthony Arrolata. Yes. He was back. So there were these like parallel tracks of old school gangsters and younger gangsters. Um, well, that was part of the soap opera that Anthony yes. had come up under Big Al, and Big Al had proposed him a couple of times. I think he proposed him once and took his name off, put his name back on, and started sending him to New York. And at the same time, Anthony's going to New York and ingratiating himself with the New York guys. Al is alienating himself from the New York guys. And mm -hmm. I want to ask your opinion on this. You, you, Brett, you mentioned little Artie. So again, some of my reporting and some of my researching tells me that when Al first started becoming a big, big deal outside of just uh, a, a, a Lieutenant or soldiers of the Shkobelis, but when he was actually had, you know, he was a shot caller at this point, mm -hmm. he, a guy named uh, Farby Serpico was the front boss of Genovese and Farby and Big Al got along incredibly well. They were very close. Um, at this time, little Artie Nigro was a lesser known commodity. And I guess there were a couple social situations that I heard about where a, at least what people that were there and had spoken to little Artie, Artie felt, that Al had big time. That, that, yeah. That, 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 and, and someone had said to Al, you know, you never know who's going to become bought. You know, a guy right. that's a, a water boy now could be a shot caller in a couple of years. Right. Because even when I covered, so, so I would say that's correct. It was just this weird symbiotic relationship where, and you know, you and I have had, various bosses over the years, you get along better with some yeah. and not, not as well with others. But at the time, um, you know, I think it was key that Anthony and the Giuses were all out on the street, you know, kind of at once prior to the murder, because it's, I feel like they built up this critical mass of people who were maybe deciding they weren't so scared of Bruno, you know, they wouldn't undermine him to his face but there was a lot of that going on in the background. And then Nigro sends who we ultimately learn was an informant, John Bologna from right. New York. And he was kind of his emissary here. And he was getting along well with Anthony Arlotta. And he would hang around with Al, but I think there was a, just a little bit of friction there. And there was some sentiment that Al just got, I guess, too big for his britches. I don't know how else to say it. It's like, yes, you're a boss, but you have no humility. I think New York thought that Bruno was not kicking up enough to New York. And he was, you know, hoarding all of his illicit proceeds for himself. So it was just this like simmering resentment that get, 
began to just bubble up and bubble up and bubble up. And he wasn't the darling anymore. Right. And then in comes this, you know, young, brash faction. Swash. Who were willing to take a shot, you know. Yeah. And Anthony Anthony uh, Benji Arlotta, uh, was the definition of swashbuckling. <laughs> yeah, he was a pirate and he, he loved being a pirate. He was a baby-faced gangster, baby-faced killer um, who immediately was the, the New York guys were smitten. They looked at him as, wow, this guy looks like he should be, uh, you know, at a Dairy Queen, uh, you know, making our milkshakes. <laughs> but this is a guy we can really depend on, uh, not just to kill, but uh, he, he was a big earner. Anthony was, you know, he was that rare combination of a guy that knew how to earn uh, and then would would murder you in the blink of an eye. Uh, and that is, those are two things that can make you go very far in the mafia. And I think Al stopped. He was using Anthony as a, uh, as a, as a way to communicate with New York. So he wasn't doing a lot of the communicating. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it was after that cigarette deal that things really right. kind of cool so, because Al asked for the sit down right and didn't decide in his favor so he was disgruntled so there were all this these kind of pockets of you know strife and infighting and, and it just all reached this kind of apex and there's something I also want to uh discuss with you and I'm sorry if I'm getting ahead of ourselves but okay. I think that there is some inside baseball or nuance to the narrative of uh, Benji uh, um, turning on Al and having Al murdered and then taking his place. That all happened. But I do think there is some layers to it. Uh, and Anthony likes to pretend, not pretend, but Anthony. Uh, and he I know that, that he didn't want Bruno to die. Right. And, I, and there's a part of me that agrees with the notion. And it's backed up by my reporting, not just what Anthony's saying, but backed up by my report that the wheels were in motion for Al to be murdered. Uh, Anthony definitely took advantage of the winds of discontent. Right. I was going to say the discontent. in Al's direction. There's no question that he leveraged that for his for his sake for his own his own uh, his own mob brand in, in yeah. his own. I don't think brand. he started it though. But I, I, I do think it's somewhat of a misnomer to make it seem like uh, Anthony was campaigning for them to hit Big Al so Anthony could take over. I think Anthony wanted Big Al out of the way, like he wanted him shelved. But the person that was campaigning, from my research, was Felix Trangisi. Felix, Trang yeah. Yeah. And I guess they had, for a long time, they had not gotten along, Felix and Al, because in my reporting and when I've spoken to Anthony Arlotta on a number of occasions, Al had them dig a ditch in Aglom in this wooded area that was intended for Felix. That's the ditch that mob associate and Arlotta's brother-in-law, Gary Westerman, ended up. That was his grave. But the original ditch they were asked to dig was for Felix. And, and I don't know if that's like a mob version of like just, you know, ADD or something, but somehow it just didn't end up there. And so they had this makeshift grave just, you know, there for the picking. And Felix had been proposed and sponsored by Bruno, uh, according to court records and FBI filing. I think the ceremony was in 82. Mm -hmm. So Felix yeah, I was going to say that was a long time ago. Felix had been made for, for 20 years when this all started to go uh, – in a southward direction for, for Big Al. But Anthony, as you mentioned, so Anthony spends that year and a half middling for, for Bruno with the guys in New York. Uh, Farby Serpico, I believe, died of cancer. Little Artie Negro takes, Negro takes over. Artie doesn't really like Al Bruno. They're butting heads. And then there's this issue with a, a a cigarette a bootleg cigarette scam that was perpetrated um allegedly uh, by a um 
a Genovese Capo down in Florida, Ray, uh, Ray Ruggiero. Yeah, not allegedly. He testified to that on the stand during okay. the trial. So. Uh, and uh, it was a $250,000 deal to buy bootleg cigarettes and then move them in China. Al got ripped, you know, got, got scammed out of 250. Mm-hmm. Felt like, you know, traditional mob protocol would get him the money back via sit down. Sit downs held. I heard in a Boca Raton, like produce warehouse, mm-hmm. and Al is not a winner at the sit down. They no. tell Al you're not going to see any he, money. He went down swinging too. It's yeah. I don't think he just and walked he was, away. He was livid, and he he was somewhat disrespectful in some of his uh, verbiage. Well, I think he's used to getting his way at that point, right. right? Because you know he had built up all these relationships. Um, but and also one thing I wanted to add about Felix is after. Bruno was killed, there was still a little bit of skirmishing going on between Anthony and the GSs and like their kind of core group and Felix, which was evidenced by now Jimmy Santanello. You know, every time there's a regime regime change, Jimmy Santanello, who owned all of the strip clubs, clubs, you know, real estate around here, um, he was like just a perennial trough for whoever was in charge. They went with him, went to him and shook him down. And I think following Bruno's death, there was this a little bit of a tug of war between Anthony and his core group, and then Felix also going to Jimmy Santanello and saying, "No, pay me." And then there were a lot of the Gius is saying, "No, pay me." There was a little bit of friction going on there. Um, well, we know that uh, Mr. Santanello has uh, has had his uh, pockets uh, quite frequently. I don't want to say pick, but these these Springfield guys get their hands in his pockets, and uh, it seems to be an endless uh, money train there. Whoever can uh, you know, get their hooks into him, and his name has appeared in, in quite a few uh, court filings and, mm-hmm. and affidavits. And the Mardi Gras strip club is uh, uh, no more. Right, end of an era. <laughs> the end of an era, but it, for a long time, it was kind of. Um, a, a big uh like their hq all the gangsters yeah it was a big place there. where a lot of the gangsters would hang out and, and do business and a lot of them would date strippers and um so it, you have a situation where for about a year a year to two years anthony's middling for for big al the uh the relationship between al and the new york guys is fraying and then two Two big things happen in, in uh, the summer of 03. You have Anthony called the New York in May in August of 03 without. I think it was May. I think it might have been May. I don't know why that sticks out in my head. At some point in, in 03, yeah. Anthony mm-hmm. is called to New York and made by Artie without Bruno's knowledge. Mm-hmm. Which, the fact they keep Bruno in the dark about this to me speaks. I mean, it, it tells a it doesn't just tell a, a chapter of the story. It tells the whole story. No, that was the one that was sponsoring it. And Anthony at that time. So I wrote some stories in between Al's murder and then before they were all charged, like within, you know, six or seven years later. And Anthony, um, there were just some, you know, gaming and loan trucking investigations going on. And Anthony got, he was obviously a prime target for the state police and the feds. And I think he got picked up on a wire talking to one of his bookies, lower level, saying, you know, I don't need Bruno Bruno anymore. I I have another in or I have another out. I forget if it was in or out, but he got picked up on a wire. And I think law enforcement started listening and they were puzzled thinking, what does he mean? So they were just starting to get a sense of the diverging tracks of Bruno and Anthony Arellata. And then, you know, Bruno gets whacked. So it well, became pretty clear then. <laughs> there's, there's one more thing I want to throw in um, to the mix here that played what I think was the final straw in the, in the green lighting of the murder, mm-hmm. which is Felix getting his hands on an FBI 302 Um, Which I still have in my desk, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Where there was a conversation in early 03, I believe, or possibly the end of 02. I think it was the end of 02, actually. uh, Where uh, Big Al Bruno was at the Red Rose Pizzeria picking up a pie. So was an FBI agent. 
the FBI agent, you know, if anybody understands the cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers aspect of organized crime or the, you know, the mafia at the highest levels, you know, you know, who's following you around every day. And uh, right. I actually think Bruna may have been at a political fundraiser. Okay. And the FBI agent, maybe they were both picking up pizzas, but I think Bruno was attending the political fundraiser, going back to the theme of him being popular yeah. among the so-called legitimate people. Um, <clears throat> and I think that FBI agent may have been surveilling it. Maybe they were both getting pizzas because the way it was portrayed in that 302 was, oh, it was just kind of a happenstance. Yeah, we just happened to run into each other. Right. And they and start Bruno, up a conversation. But the conversation, what... Like lasted like a half hour. It wasn't something. It wasn't a you know. It wasn't two just minute, a passing It wasn't a two minute. Hey, how you doing? How's the family? No, it was more substantive than that. And part of like Bruno's ease and you know comfort with you know people in law enforcement, even reporters. She used to be friendly to me when I used to write about him. You know, politicians. I think part of his ease with people got him into trouble in that conversation yeah. um, because he talked think... about who had been made and right. how he didn't like, you know, the guy who had been made. And so it wasn't just, hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Enjoy your pizza. It was more than that. Well, it sounded and... subversive. It was Al talking about what had happened. He had to go serve a short period of time in jail mm -hmm. um, and talking about when he was gone for a year or less than a year, what had happened without him in town. And he was bad mouthing, Superior. Yeah, yeah, Fusco. Yeah. Yeah, Mila Fusco mm -hmm. was the one who got his button. Baba uh, sponsored him. He didn't think the New York guys should have okayed that. Uh, speaking on um, what what Big Al Bruno was said to this FBI agent, which made it into the three hundred two. I don't believe though Al was a confidential informant. No, I don't either. But that's the way it was twisted. I also. I want to get your opinion on this. I I agree with the Bruno family um, in their contention that putting that 302 into a, a court filing without redactions is asking for the New York Mafia to come kill Al Bruno. It was quite stunning. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't, I'm, I still, I'm not convinced they did it deliberately. But the feds, meaning they, um, no, I don't think it, was it wasn't deliberate, grand... it's negligent, even if it wasn't. Yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of the word I was getting to. So I don't think it was a grand scheme for the government to get Bruno killed. But I do think it was very short sighted at a minimum to not understand the implications of that. And then those 302s, you know, once the defense attorneys get them, they get circulated around the whole city. Um, and I think. As we've been discussing, there are a lot of things went into the murder of Al Bruno, the dynamic of what led to his murder. But that's kind of the smoking gun that Felix brings down to New York and, you know, saying, hey, look, he's on record talking to this FBI agent. And, you know, if they're going by their historic code, there's no way they won't green like that. Like that's the ultimate sin. Right. So I think it was negligent for sure. And and Felix, the irony here is that Felix saw his end game as bringing the 302 to New York, getting little Artie and, and his group, uh, you know, his top advisor was was uh, Patty DeLuca, Scott DeLuca, mm -hmm. getting all those guys all riled up and angry uh, so that they can order Al's murder and Felix can slide in as the new boss. But what actually happens right. is... He's not just doesn't get the nod to become boss. He's pushed out altogether. Anthony and the Gius brothers, uh, within a month or two, uh, the Gius brothers show up at a construction site and, mm -hmm. and like, beat him up and say, "You're done. We're we're uh, we're putting you on the shelf. Uh, not right. only you're not become boss, you're you're no longer welcomed around here, and you're, you're not." Yeah, I think they knocked him off a ladder or something and tuned yeah. him up pretty well. But he Felix never admitted that um, until he became you know, a government witness. Right. So one more thing I want to bring up, and then we're going to get to the actual assassination and the aftermath of it. it some more of my reporting that's come out in, in the last year uh, is that, and there was a little bit of reporting on this 
back in, in 2003, right after Al's murder. So I don't want to take credit like I'm the first one reporting on this. There was reporting on this uh, out of Connecticut. But um, it looks like one of Al's goals in 2003 that ended in his murder, uh, he was looking to push into Connecticut uh, and, and get a bigger, if not a, if not a whole brand new hold, a bigger hold on, on rackets that were going on in Connecticut. And I'm told that he was rounding up a group of Connecticut younger wise guys to try to create a crew, get them on record, get them made. Uh, at, at one point, there's a, a mob associate that Al's connected to uh, who ends up dead in the spring of 03. Um, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole because there's we could do a whole episode on that because there's right. a million theories on, on why that happened. But the one thing, my big takeaway from that is regardless of who killed, his name is Joel Mazzotta, that regardless mm -hmm. of who killed Joel Mazzotta, it's pretty clear that Al was making a move into Connecticut and that this was upsetting both New York and New England, the patriarchs. Right. I think that's mostly accurate. I would just probably say that I don't think it was a new hold. I think he already had a foothold and say right. Hartford, he may have been trying to like move South. Yeah. Um, because I know during the trial, there were these two brothers, the Grant brothers they own some really high-end restaurants in Hartford, West Hartford. Um, Billy, well, Billy Hot Dog Grant was their I mean, father. One of those guys who ended up, yeah, who ended up getting killed. Right? Yeah, um, and they had a strip club down in New York City or the greater New York City area. Um, you know, so I think he already had a presence there, but maybe he was trying to move. You know. Farther down into New Haven, yeah, and I know there was some friction. A, big, a bigger presence. Yeah, I would more say. Accurate. Mm -hmm. So, but this didn't. From, from what I have heard and seen, some uh, records, law enforcement records, um, saying was that the, the patriarchs were upset, and the little, little Artie and these guys were upset out in the Bronx because they weren't seeing any. They were hearing that there was an increased presence. Uh, from Al in Connecticut, but they weren't seeing an increase in the money they were getting, right. which already added to the narrative that he was holding back on them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have all these things that are all... It was all a perfect stars. storm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Our stars are aligning, and it's uh, November of 03, and the order comes from Artie to Felix to Anthony mm -hmm. uh, to, to hit Bruno. And as you mentioned earlier, a couple of weeks before they hit Bruno, they kill uh, Anthony Arrelata's brother-in-law, Gary Westerman, um, him and the Gius brothers. Right. Because and that was kind Westerman. of reminiscent of the, the man you were talking about who was lured to the barn, you know, with, under the auspices of we have a score. They did the same. So it was Arrelata, the Gius brothers, and um, Emilio Fusco. Emilio Fusco was there too, right? Yep who lured Westerman, who was, you know, like a thug, a longtime thug, and kind of on the, always on the periphery of the organized crime. They lured him to this property with the promise of, this is a home invasion, we're going to get drugs, we're going to get money. So he went trotting over there with them, thinking it was just going to be another score. And instead, they shot him in the head, and they bludgeoned him with a shovel, and they threw him in the ditch that was originally intended for Felix Trangisi. And buried him. And this is literally, I think, two weeks before they killed Bruno. I think it was like two and a half, three. Uh, yeah, it was really close in proximity. And and you know, in Springfield throughout that summer and fall of 03, Anthony and the GS is like you said, they're finally all out on the street together because there was a lot of like gaps. Uh, of yeah. one of them would be in jail, two of them would be on the street, two of them mm -hmm. would be in jail, and one of them would be on the street. Yeah. Um, and it seems like, again, based on consuming your reporting at the time, mm -hmm. talking to people, reading surveillance reports and whatnot, was, Anthony was really starting to feel himself uh, in that spring and summer of 03. I'm sure that the all the New York, uh, the love fest with New York was going to his head. And it seemed like every night out 
in the bars and in the clubs, there was a different altercation. Um, Anthony was like fighting wars on multiple fronts. He's beefing with the the Manzies. Um, he's you know bar fights lead to like his house getting shot up, like his house getting shot up. And I think there was a suspicion that Westerman may have been involved. Yeah, with his house getting shot up, but I I guess I I never felt comfortable. Like I wasn't certain of that, but that was among the reasons I think Anthony thought he may have been involved with his house getting shot up. And then there was another incident I want to throw at you. I think I was the first one to report it. I apologize if you've already reported this. I might have just missed it and thought I was reporting it for the first time. Uh, there was some type of physical altercation uh, in that that summer between I think it was a uh, Ty. Uh, Gs and Big Al. No, I reported that before it was over okay. the watch. Yeah, over the watch. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. I, I apologize if I ever told nope. anyone that I was the. No problem. It's okay. Uh, um, um, no, they did get into a beef. I've heard a couple of different renditions, but the one I trust the most is that um, because you know the Gs's uncle ran a jeweler. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a jewel shop, jewelry mm -hmm. shop. And so there was some accusation of a Rolex being fake or something like that. So the two of them meet outside the Worthington Street bars where they all used to hang around. And the version I heard was that Bruno goes to slap Ty across the face, which etiquette dictates you're supposed to just sit there and take it. Take it, yeah. And he didn't. He stopped the slap. Well, he said so, he, had, he made some comment. What I heard was that you know, your brother's a fucking asshole. Or your brother's a fucking prick. And probably, I mean, right. that's, that's kind of like the soundtrack of all they. Right. To. And then, and then Al was upset that Benji and Chicky and a couple of the other guys that were around uh, weren't more, I guess, on his side mm -hmm. uh, in reprimanding Ty for putting his hands on Al. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it, it created more uh, division and uh, more. They were certainly than... feeling their oats at that time. Yeah. For sure. Anthony and the Jesus and the Jesus had no fear. Right. You know, they hadn't since they were teenagers. Right. I mean, these guys were, all three of these guys were brought. I mean, they were just brawlers. No. Anthony has no inhibitions, yeah. as you mentioned, in terms of like to run a scam to commit violence, to, he was just the, they were all the ultimate opportunists. Yeah. Um, they were pirates. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, I, I Sometimes for people that don't know the story of Springfield, it, it's not a, it's not an exact perfect analogy, but I try to tell people that uh, know about Joey Merlino in Philadelphia. I'm like, Anthony was Joey Merlino in Western Massachusetts to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, in that that he was a young guy that had a lot of respect from the OGs and people gravitated towards him and they were fearless. Uh, the difference is that, you know, Anthony cooperated and, and was more pragmatic about uh, when he was facing all that time. And, and Joey just continues to roll the dice at the, uh, the uh, craps table of life and, uh, <laughs> has yet to crap out. But, uh, I, you know, that's how Anthony was. He was a young guy. He was in his early 30s. And he was a, a he was a, like shot out of a cannon once he yeah. actually was given. I don't want to say permission, but when he was given kind of the green light, okay, spread your wings. He was yeah. he and the Jesus were like shot out of a cannon. It's the only he was, I a, mean, Genovese, just, he was a Genovese capo at thirty three years old. I mean that's that's pretty heady territory for someone that young. Yeah, yeah, it was around. He was probably in his. Mid mid thirties, yeah. yeah. No, he certainly and his he rocketed to the top. You know, once he lit that match. So he, know, goes, he was there. So they get the order. Uh, it goes from Felix is is I think it was in, they were in front of a garage in the Bronx, I think, uh, on the street in a walk and talk. Uh, Artie gives it to Felix. Felix comes back to Springfield, relays it to Anthony. Anthony then. Taps the Gs brothers, who in turn hire this local crazy crash dummy. They <laughs> the call him a crash dummy. dummy. Yeah. Local crazy um, 
another guy that was just a brawler with without the mob pedigree, Frankie Roach. Yeah. Mind you, I had never heard of him when his name started kicking around. I thought, why have I have not heard of him? Like, I've been asleep at the switch. And then when I started looking in our clips and talking to some law enforcement, I mean, he really just came out of nowhere. And I think that may have been part like by design because they didn't want to get somebody too, too connected to their crew. You know, they wanted to get this random person, but who would do their bidding right? and was similar in temperament. Um, and that was Frankie Roach. I think another thing that they, in their minds, thought that they were being smart. And tell me what you think about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so Frankie Roach had a beef with Al Bruno that had nothing to do with all this Bruno political... Um, it didn't, but that was opinion. also indicative of indicative of people were willing, starting to be willing to challenge, challenge him. him right. Yeah. So Frankie Roach throughout the uh, late summer, uh, early fall of '03 had, you know, he was a, a you know, a drug addict and a, just a, a wild and crazy guy. Thing. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he tore up some bars and some restaurants. One and, in particular that Bruno had some kind of affiliation with. Um, it was a little bar in the South End, and he got in some kind of beef with one of the employees, Frankie Roach, got in a fight. He was kicked out, came back a couple hours later and just trashed the whole place. Like mirrors, bottles of booze. It was just like, looked like a nuclear war had happened there. And I don't think he did it in particular to challenge Bruno. Maybe he didn't even know that, you know, the place Bruno had some stake in it. But once he heard that, Bruno was angry. He didn't seem to care. Um, and I don't know, have you ever seen that surveillance report where Bruno was sitting with some other guys, one guy was wearing a wire and the one guy was saying, you know, he's got guns. And Bruno was like, we've got guns, we've got bigger guns. Right. So he wasn't really taking it seriously. But, you know, all these growing numbers of people seem to be emboldened to challenge him. And it seems like that the... I shouldn't say it seems. I was told that this was the mindset. Uh, the Gia's and Anthony figured because Frankie Roach already had this issue with Bruno that the police wouldn't look at Anthony and the Gia's or New York. They would just think it was some personal issue between Frankie Roach and Al Bruno and, and Roach was basically set up to be the patsy. Yeah. I mean, I also heard, and you probably heard that I think there was some talk about killing Roach, you know, right. after he whacked See, him, and, and that didn't happen. And right, which would have been, yeah, I'm, I'm not advocating murder in any way, no, shape, or form, <laughs> but you would think that the the play there, if you were going by the traditional mafia thought process, would be that have, you have Frankie Roach kill Big Al Bruno, and then a day or two later, Frankie Roach ends up in the trunk of a car. Mm, yeah, but that didn't but happen. That didn't happen, and then Eventually, um, the chickens come home to roost. It took a while to make that case, though. It did. So Frankie was the first domino to fall. Um, he fled the area, spent some time in Connecticut, um, some spots in New York, ultimately ended up in Florida, where um, local police and the feds tracked him. And then when they arrested him in the middle of the night, they accidentally shot him in the back. Um and he was very seriously injured. He, um, he, got he, a settlement. he got a settlement from that, didn't he? He did. He did. Um, but, I mean, just this whole era was just filled with just craziness. And that just added another layer to it. You Like, you arrest this guy, he's on his stomach on the ground, handcuffed, shoot him in the back, and then you have to pay him a settlement. But so he was charged alone in state court on the eve of trial, um, suddenly they call off the trial. So it's obvious, you know, what had happened that Frankie Roach had flipped, but nobody, even in these little mob circles, I, I don't think anyone believed it at first. Um, so then there was a quiet period and then Freddie gets charged and he's charged alone in federal court with conspiring after Frankie Roach pleads guilty in federal court. Um, 
And then all the rest of the dominoes fell after that. Not because obviously we know that Freddie didn't, um, you know, he never cooperated, but the feds in the interim were able to convince a lot of other people to cooperate. And that really started to me like that was the turning point, the demise of, you know, the greater Springfield model. It, it didn't take Anthony a long time to make the decision. Nope. Actually, the prosecutor told me that Anthony made the cal- calculus in his head like really swiftly. Um, because I think he was arrested in March. Pretty sure it was early March. By St. Patrick's Day, he had agreed to cooperate. Yeah, I, I'll I'll tell you that in my uh, in my observations here, it it, it seems like you, when you're being pragmatic and you're doing the math in your head, if you have something that's considered incredibly valuable, and I'm not saying that the Gia's brothers aren't valuable. But the real value for the government, what Anthony could give them, was the city administration of the Genovese crime family. Right. He was he was the top guy in Greater Springfield. He had all these connections in New York. He could put Artie and you know the right. mix in their holy grail is to get a New York boss. So as long as you can provide them something of of tremendous value like that, like a sitting cabinet of mafia dons in a in one of the five families then, you know, it might not look like it, but in reality, you have quite a bit of leverage in making that deal. When I say leverage, I mean in the sense of a lot of- You need to add value. You need to add value. And, you know, not only, so he had the the New York connection, Um, you know, he cleared up Westerman, which I think local authorities thought they would never solve. Because I know they- they used to dig in other places trying to find Gary Westerman to no avail. Seven years went by before they found him with Anthony's help. Mm-hmm. And they also gave him the near fatal shooting of Frank Dadabo, that union boss um, who angered Nigro um, in New York. And that wasn't even on anyone's radar. Great so point. Anthony went from being the darling of, you know, the local criminal element to the darling of the feds. Yep. You know, he was equally as per- persuasive in both circles. There was that great exchange in court where Anthony, they said to Anthony, what did uh, Artie tell you? When, <laughs> get when better you told, at headshots. Yeah, get yeah. better at your headshots. Well, yeah. because he didn't kill for, uh, the union boss because he shot him in the body. They, they unloaded their clips into this guy. I think he was hit yeah. nine or ten times. But they didn't hit him in the head. And, and he right. was, yeah. that's what get better uh, Artie, at headshots. That yeah. was the advice that Artie gave him. Yep. Um, so Anthony and Felix cut deals and they both do about six, seven years. Anthony did 99 months. Okay. Eight, and seven, eight Felix years. did, I think he got eight years. Um, I think he got eight years. Yeah. Either seven or eight years. Um, and I think Anthony thought just because, you know, he was, more valuable. I mean, Felix obviously brought to the table that he brought the 302, you know, to New York, but Anthony had, I think a lot more information to give them. Mm -hmm. And I think Anthony hoped that he was going to get maybe time served because he had been in prison for 2010. He had already been in prison for probably four years by the time he was formally sentenced. Um, Felix came home before Anthony. So he probably got a little Bit, a little less time than that. But he's just basically faded into the background, as far as I know. Both Anthony and Felix, it's not, uh, this isn't any breaking news. Uh, Stephanie was the first one to break this news that uh, both of them are, are back in Springfield. They're not living in witness protection. They came back home after a prison and, and they're living, at least Anthony is living pretty openly. Mm-hmm. Um, Very openly. It speaks to, I think, the. <laughs> The mafia in America in 2023, uh, it's become a, a semi non violent endeavor. It's, it's endeavor. survivable. It's survivable yeah. Yeah. to, you know, cooperate. I mean, Felix, I will say, like, Anthony has not lowered his profile, let's say that, as you're well aware of. Felix, I think, just as far as I know, went back to just living kind of a quiet life with his 
wife and children and may have, I don't even know what he's doing for work these days. I there was say, there, there are no gangster retirement plans. No, there are not. There was this big rumor when he came home that he was working at a Rocky's hardware store. So I went to this Rocky Rocky's hardware store, snooping around three or four times. But I think he may have gone back to some kind of contracting, which is what he did before he went to jail. But, uh, you know, the one part of the story that, at least tangentially, is, is still um, in real time, it, it's still evolving, is the fate of, of Freddie Gius. Um, and he, according to the federal government, in October of 2018, he murdered the infamous Boston crime lord, well-established confidential informant, Whitey Bulger. Uh, mm -hmm. Bulger was in a protection unit down in Florida. For whatever reason, uh, was transferred, went into general population at uh, Hazleton. Mm -hmm. uh, Misery Mountain. In West Virginia, yeah. which was a place that has a, a, a lot of East Coast gangsters and tough guys. Put a general population, and he lasted about eight hours right. before he's murdered. It, it sounds like, based on the, reading the the court filings and the police reports, that it had leaked into the uh, general population at least forty eight hours before Bulger got there. That he was on his way and was going to be placed in the general population. Uh, there are three people, including Freddie G, or two people other than Freddie Gius that are mm -hmm. that are charged in it. Freddie is, is accused of being the ringleader. One of so Freddie was just is the type of guy that does doesn't like rats, period. And he is a, a, a someone that no, and he lacks inhibitions and and right and, and is is someone that is predisposed to violence and, and he likes to be a shot caller, you know, right. as they refer to him in some of the stories, but about who he was in prison. And you know, Freddie's got some charisma despite the fact yeah. that you know he's like a ruthless killer um but when freddie actually was always very friendly to me even when i was covering him he still sends me christmas cards and so i was acutely aware of which prison he was in because i would get cards from him every year and so when i saw the news that bulger was getting moved to west virginia i thought huh that's where freddie is and I didn't think much of it. And then a day later, when the news broke that Bulger had been murdered in the most violent fashion, I thought, no, could it be Freddie? There's a lot of guys in prison there. But allegedly, um, it was Freddie. And like you said, a, another Italian gangster. And then a third guy who allegedly acted like... Uh, acted as a lookout, a lookout yeah. but they're going to trial uh, literally in like a, a year from right about now yep. as it stands. And uh, they, like you said, it was a brutal murder. They beat him with a lock, uh, a lock tied to a belt. Um, or I think in a sock, I thought, but um, the indictment just said they hit him repeatedly in the head, but yeah, and I, they think gouged I his eyes. This lock in a sock. And, they gouged yeah. his eyes out and it was, and it his was tongue real, or something. Yeah. I don't know. It sounded like an ugly, <laughs> an ugly, ugly end. But the, yeah. the good news for Freddie, at least, is that the government came out a couple months ago and said they will not be seeking the death penalty. Uh, so in some ways, it's like he was already doing life in prison. He wasn't really, probably didn't have much of a chance to get out. Oh, uh, yeah. Out, outside Zero of the chance. Sentencing reduction, right. It, and I imagine that factored in, because what do you have? have left except for your sock to raise inside of prison. Right. Um, and that was the second time Freddie faced that same conversation with the government when he was tried in New York City. Um, are we going to seek the death penalty? So, so he dodged that bullet twice. Um, Freddie did. But now he's in this super max prison Um where like the Unabomber was and until right. he died and the Somali pirates, speaking of pirates. Um, and I think he's on lockdown uh, 23 hours a day from what I've heard. So I don't know. And he, he, and was, he spent years in the hole, years and years. Boy, I think they waited to charge him. They were four years in the hole. Yeah. I, you know, 
his he had a personal besides just hating rats, he had a personal vendetta against Bulger because one of uh, Freddie's confidants in state prison in the nineties was an old school Irish gangster named Freddie Weichel. Uh, Weichel had been framed uh, by Woody Bulger for a murder mm -hmm. that he didn't commit. Uh, Weichel got out of prison in seventeen, but had done thirty six years. I believe he got a thirty million dollar uh, settlement from the state. But Freddie, if you believe that Freddie uh, murdered this guy, so murdered Bulger, uh, there was motivation on behalf of uh, Weichel that he that he had cost Weichel, you know. 30, 36 years of, of time. Um, I had talked to some people that know Freddie and, and said that uh, Freddie G is, and that he was still communicating with Freddie Weichel and, and uh, was thought very, uh, like a Freddie Weichel was like a father, almost like a father figure. Mm. Well, also think about it in prison, like your world gets very small. Yeah. You know. Um, and and at that point, at that point, Freddie was in his 20s. This was in the 90s. Right. But I just, no, I just mean like when you, you're spending life in prison, um, your world gets very small. So other issues, this is just my dime store analysis of, you know, other issues become consuming and very big. And, you know, and so I imagine if he did do it, um, he's thinking, what do I really have to lose? So as we wrap up, um, there, there's still some semblance of, uh, the Genovese Springfield crew that exists today. Semblance. It's like a it's yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a shadow of, yeah. of what it once was. Uh, they still, there's some part of it that's still at that traditional ground zero in South End at uh, the Mount Carmel Club. Albert Calvinisi um, has been alleged to, to be well, he runs the club, supposedly. Right, he runs the club. Yeah. I don't know if you would officially call him a mob mob capo or mm, crew boss. I, or, I still haven't been I able to get him. He to be just a rogue guy. Right. Yeah. But he was a guy that used to collect for mm -hmm. Bruno, used to collect for Anthony uh, Arolata, a convicted loan shark, was on tape uh, taking a guy's Packing head. Around a, yeah, he, he beat up a... A state police informant on a wire. Yeah, it took a debtor to put his head. Seven through, years for that, I think. Put his head in a do in the door in a car door and slammed it. It's yeah, it was and it was all I listened to that recording and it's yeah. like, like in broad daylight. Yeah. yeah, like in the middle of an intersection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what stood out to me in the last couple of years, uh, even though um, Mr. Calvinisi, uh, to his credit, it, you know hasn't been in handcuffs since the, he walked out of prison from that case. Uh, he's avoided arrest and indictment in a number of cases that have come down in Springfield related to organized crime, whether it be Italian or Latino. And that's the one thing I wanted to throw out there. You know, as the last couple of years, we found out that the Latin Kings, which are a, a, a organized crime group made up of, uh, you know, Hispanics, big on the East Coast. Big in greater Springfield, too. Right. We're yeah. using the Mount Carmel Club as some type of HQ, planning and assaults and murders. Mm -hmm. I just I just couldn't imagine in the days of the, the Frankie Skyball or Big Al uh, of you know allowing a basically a Hispanic street gang. Yeah, warm welcome Mount, to the Latin Kings. Yeah, come on in and and do your. I know that the Latin Kings ostensibly try to purport that they're not a criminal group, but it's, there's so much evidence that they're just a purely a criminal group. So you couldn't even like say, Oh, I, I thought they were coming in here for, you know, some type of community outreach. Like you knew they were coming in there to do dirt. Um, no, well, there was a connection. Well, from what I've heard from folks who have affiliations with the club, not ownership, but you know, who, who go there, I think that the club wasn't making any money. And so they would host card games for, you know, Latino groups um, and they would let them come in. You know, th there was revenue coming from it. And also the head of the Latin Kings on the whole East Coast, apparently, had uh, a, fam a familial connection. Right. Chick we mentioned Chicky, yeah. uh, Dave Chicatelli. His nephew, uh, uh, Michael Chicatelli. His nephew, uh, who they call Merlin. Mm -hmm. 
was an Italian guy that worked his way up the ranks of the Latin Kings from some connections he had made in prison. Um, and then he, he's now a cooperator. So yeah. The, uh, all the rage, I guess. Right. Yeah. The, la the last thing I'll say is that, um, Springfield has maybe the oldest, I'm going to use the word active very loosely, but semi-active, uh, wise guy in America, Mario Fiore. Mario Fiore. He's, he's 99, he's 99 years 99. old. Yes. One mm -hmm. of the old uh, Frankie Skyballs guys he used to run, um, a lot of junkets, uh, travel junkets to, to Vegas. And, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to impugn him. I don't think he's doing dirt anymore, doing rackets, but he's around the South end, or at least he was up until, you know, a little recently, um, around the South end, you know, he's kind of this, uh, old school sage or, or a, a yeah, character. I heard somebody, I heard a young guy smacked him around a right. little bit though, and it created this brouhaha. Well, yeah. Where people were like, how dare you? Yes. Right. Mario, who's, you know, been around since the fifties. Uh, does it blow your mind that a guy like Mario, again, I don't think he's involved in, in mafia affairs, but he's around there. He's obviously feels good enough at 99 to be walking around, hanging around, drinking his espresso, eating cannolis. Right. Uh, it's good it, for him. Yeah. It, it, some of these guys, it's like, you know, that's the life they want to, they don't have any desire to go live in the retirement home and play shuffleboard. They want to be in the yeah, That's what they know. Yeah. That's what they know. But uh, hopefully, hopefully we've been talking to uh, Mario. Hopefully some point soon we can have him on and, and talk to him. I told him we don't have to talk about anything, uh, you know, uh, gangster related. I just want to hear stories about running at the Copacabana mm -hmm. and running around with Liza Minnelli and Frank Sinatra. Those are the stories I want to hear because I know he was in, in that uh, whenever Sinatra would come to Massachusetts, he'd spend a lot of time uh, with the Springfield guys and the Boston guys. Well, definitely tune in. Fingers yeah. crossed for that. Well, Stephanie, this was amazing. Uh, Al Bruno, uh, 57 years old, was assassinated 20 years ago this week, November 23rd, 2003. We're now at the end of November 2023. Quite a bit has changed. Um, we, we hope we brought you up to date on all of it and gave you some good insight and analysis. Uh, Stephanie, I, I tell everyone where they can find you and um, – Obviously, if you if you Google anything related to the Springfield Mafia, you're going to be reading her stuff, and it's, she has such a great archive. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Well, can you tell them is there uh, uh, people that they can contact you or or, or uh, oh, you can find me at um, masslife.com. My email address is on every story that I write. Um, I'm on I'm limited on Twitter, and I don't I don't have a YouTube channel like my fancy friend Scott here. But you can find me at masslife.com. Well, we're going to have her back on. We had her on the audio um, a couple years ago, uh, just when we were just audio on iTunes and Spotify. Now we're we're multimedia now and and, and coming to you on YouTube. So uh, Stephanie's going to hopefully be someone that we bring back on. And whenever whenever there's anything big happening in Springfield, we're going to go right to the source, which we like to do here on the OG and get it from Stephanie. So thank you so much, Stephanie. My Stephanie pleasure. Barry. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I and I've said uh, multiple times, and I'll say it again. I wouldn't know anything about the mafia in Springfield if it wasn't for Stephanie. Before I even met Stephanie, there was you know probably a decade of me um, learning about Springfield from her reporting. So uh, I, I have the honor of uh, piggybacking off people like her and Jerry Capace in New York and George Anastasia in in Philadelphia. Uh, Bulldog Drummond in, in Chicago, guys that are just uh, men and women that are just great at their jobs that that really uh, laid the groundwork for me to, to be great at my job. Well done. Thank you, Stephanie. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Hope you got a great week uh, of, of, uh, of turkey and family and friends. We'll see you next week on the OG Pod. I'm Scott Bernstein. Out. Mm -hmm.